This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. I couldn't think of a better way to spend a Friday evening than meeting you. Pleasure is mine. Really, the pleasure is mine. Online, different introduction. I think it's the first time we see each other. Just maybe an hour ago or less, I sent you a voice note and you sent me back. I didn't really know what you sound like. You were very, very kind from the first seconds. You said, like, Sterjit ul Doctor Hassan. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, and I'm we'll, like, we'll formalize it, Mr. Shatah. You know, hey, oh, no, 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 yeah. Mr. Shatah to me is probably as, uh, as you know, doctor to you. So, yeah, and I, I liked it right away. I was like, yeah. okay, khalas, hani, hani. So then I thought, Absolutely. You know what? I, I keep my word when it comes to punctuality. And I sort of timed everything to get back and set things up for six o'clock and then it didn't cross my mind that not just the checkpoints for the COVID right. permits but uh, the whole stretch from Berbir to Mathaf going back into Maram Khair was blocked so Anna for me the most concerning thing on my mind is getting home at six o'clock to keep my word so I was embarrassed to send you a voice oh, note saying no. I'm running 15 minutes late but the way you met the way you responded I could tell right away I'm going to love this conversation because you were not just kind with the slight delay. You said, Look, hold what? Look, I'm home. Absolutely. <laughs> it's Friday afternoon. <laughs> it's Friday evening. <laughs> exactly. And exactly. then the nicest absolutely. thing I loved, you're like, just WhatsApp me when you're home. <laughs> like, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to make sure I'm on time, 6 15, just because you're being so nice. So this time around, you know, it's, it's really it's the least. And honestly, I was just lounging, just enjoying, you know, wrapping up the week. So, you know, it's, it's lovely. But it's I'll say something. Uh, no, well, the, it's, I like that we have this mutual pleasure. And I think <laughs> there's something there's something quite nice about um, about Twitter. And I th- we kind of hinted yeah. at it before we started. It opens doors. Right. There's all these problems Absolutely. with social media and all, there, we can endlessly discuss the bad Absolutely. stuff. But the good stuff is is real, and I don't think we would have ever. Maybe we wouldn't we wouldn't know each other otherwise. And we don't really know each other. We kind of just know each other's words. And I enjoy uh, whatever the word is. It could be synergy. I don't know what the word is precisely, but it's when you're thinking of something, you're trying to formulate it in whatever 180 characters, whatever the limit is, <laughs> 220. I'm not sure. That I little, don't mind the limit. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then you kind of notice that there's other people who are either agreeing or they're productively disagreeing in a measured right. way. Right. And you kind of follow each other and you learn about each other. And then on occasion, we, whether intended or not, we sort of gang up on people, <laughs> but politely, politely, politely. <laughs> like very diplomatically, we sort of say, no, that's Constructively. Not- We constructively Constructively. criticize, yes. And this happened not that long ago. Absolutely. And maybe we can kind of start there because I think we we agreed to do this conversation maybe within, I I can't remember exactly when was it, a day or two maybe following the assassination. Ah. So it must have been maybe last Saturday or so. The day exactly, it escapes me now. It was a few days ago. Yep. But I think it was just yeah, after yeah. the assassination. The time frame, absolutely. The time frame was right after the assassination. Right. Like within a, way, th- within a day or two. Within a day or two. And I think it was yeah. only because we were literally, we were fed up. Absolutely. And I think if the word is, I think you, you s- described yourself as a distru- disgruntled citizen. Disgruntled. 
I couldn't find a better word to describe myself at that moment. I'm like, you know what? Let's do this. Let's vent. And I, I really appreciated what you did without, we don't need to name names here, or it's not, sure. maybe the names are not even that important, actually. It's really the, the thought process of there's a crime, there's an assassination. Absolutely. And then there's familiar names that start trying to go a different route. They, maybe the, the crime is sort of, it's, I don't know what the word is. Yeah. It's, it's sort yeah. of not, it doesn't take- Diluted. Stage. It's diluted, yes, it's exactly. Diluted. Absolutely. It's diluted with, with other things that should not derail from the crime, Absolutely. and yet it does. And it takes a life of its own. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start there before we get into everything else. Do you see yourself as, in a way, trying to steer the narrative to a more truthful place? And do you see your role? And I know it's it's like, I'm not trying to make it bigger than life here. Just as an individual citizen who's proactively tweeting regularly about the situation. And it's a citizen expressing his thoughts. But do you see yourself as trying to steer the ship better? or offer maybe the facts over fiction? What motivates you to get involved in that kind of a thread? Because I know what I'm doing. I, I think I'm, I think I'm, maybe I'm more selfish, maybe, in that I see something that, that hits home and I try to push back in, a, in an eloquent way, in a diplomatic way. Maybe to me, it's maybe more personal, I don't know. But I'm curious from your side, why do you get off your couch or maybe you stay on it? <laughs> and you literally sometimes I jump off <laughs> you jump and you go and you try to make you drive your point home and then you sort of get the attention of people like me and other people as well and I just I'm curious what, what motivates you to do that online well to be very honest the, the key motivation is um and I think you, you mentioned this very well Ronnie is this trying to stay within the realm of fact and truth because, well, the because is going to open up, I think, a can of worms. Well, you're not, no, something nicer than a can of worms. But there's so much, I think, at least in, in you know, you mentioned the personal. This is personal to me. As a citizen, this is personal to mm. me. It is personal to me, not, of course, in, in any sense that it may be uh, personal to others, but it is personal to me to be living in, in, a, you know, in such a situation. I'm sure there's much to say about how bad and how horrible the situation is. And then yet be faced with these kind of attempts at narratives that derail, that dilute, that, you know, steer us away from the problematic, that, that even, you know, continuously weaving fictions and weaving narratives that have, at least in my personal history, you know, be, you know growing up in Lebanon and, you know, remaining here, it's, it's been a part, an, an absolute integral part of the entire mess we're in. Hmm. The BS, the lying, the... the absolute kind of you know narration of things as they didn't occur or as you said derailing narratives blowing up narratives out of proportion or on the contrary dera- de- you know deflating others mm-hmm. and so there's something personal about this for me not only in terms of my personal conviction to truth itself and i think that's absolutely you know a, a matter of principle but also as a citizen this this constant being you know lied to this constant being you know faced with fabrication after fabrication, um, you know, take examples like every, all the narratives that have come up since, you know, the, you know, the, the cataclysmic explosion of Beirut, yeah. Yeah. right? And August for every single narrative from the welder narrative to this other narrative. And here we are six months later, lost in the narratives. And it's been a history of this. This isn't a month to a year to, this is just the entire history, at least, you know, to bracket out the war era, at least post Taif, right? I mean, you know, right. as a citizen, because my citizenship, so to speak, as in, you know, living here and being aware was mostly post Taif, of course, um, you know, because supposedly the nation building or, you know, post-war nation building started there. And it's just been BS after BS the entire period. And so, it, you know, as you said, yes, usually I'm sitting on a couch, but sometimes I fly off the couch. I read something, I'm like, what is this? Right. More so when you're talking about cold-blooded assassination, right? When you're sitting there and you're like, what do you mean? But lost in the narrative, I love the way you're describing it. Would you, before, we, we, um, I'm going to try to step out of yeah. the sort of story and we'll jump back in. Do you think that is 
a historic story for Lebanon. And even the history in itself is lost Absolutely. in the narrative. Absolutely. And, it's and pathologies. It, it's pathology. Mythology. Oh, mythology, mythology, right. And, Myth and, weaving. And so you, you're, in a way, you're describing yourself mostly as a post-Civil War citizen, although, I mean, I'm guessing yeah. you're sort of, you remember aspects of the war and you probably... But there was no citizenry. There was no citizenry, right. This is really right. interesting. I mean, I, yeah, but the fact is there's still none, but, you know, that's, that's, right. that's a whole problematic on its own, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you, you're cognitive, mm, you're, you're, you're self-aware of the fiction. You're, you're, yeah. You know that this is surrounding you. And can I, is it something that is more recent in terms of deliberately challenging it? Yes. And is it, is it post-blast or does it go really to the protest movement and then sort of evolves? October 17. Mm, mm. I think my, my first kind of, um, I mean, I've been on Twitter for a while, but really very low key, barely do anything there, you know, but the, the you know, I think the first kind of, you know, I, I felt like you need to be a part of this, no matter what, you know, how tiny our voices are, but, you know, mm -hmm. put together, they start to make a loud noise, right? Um, I think October 18, I would say, was like my first kind of, okay, maybe we can start to steer a narrative. Maybe we can start to remove the debris of, of you know, post-war fictions and pre-war fictions and maybe, right? Because there was a moment there. So definitely pre-August 4, definitely pre-August 4. Uh, not much pre-October, not much. I'm curious. Um, that, well, that was like a defining moment. But, but for you, and this is really individual, for your, yeah. In, in, yeah, your yeah. in your life, why did it take off following the initial days of the protest movement? And what was it like before for you? How were you expressing this? Because I know that you have yeah. you have the ability, and I think I'm I, I'm envious to do this in a classroom. You're right. an AUB professor, and you're able to <laughs> you're able to speak your truth regularly. And if they don't listen, they sort of they get they they're punished. So in a way, <laughs> no, uh, no, they're not punished. Hold on, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but but I mean, they're they're going to benefit from was, listening to you. So and, and in a way you have this, like, <laughs> I hope so, yeah. But there's a built-in <laughs> audience that you have naturally right. in the classroom. But why did the protest movement take that to Twitter or, or even right. beyond the classroom? Why was it sort of, what was, the, what, was the, what, what was it about the protest movement that made you do sure. this online? Um, so you're absolutely right in pointing to the, to the pre-protest movement and pre-October kind of setting. That was always, you know, kind of for me, the, the space of the classroom, the space of the, you know, the university in general, not just the mm. classroom. And mm -hmm. uh, that was always, you know, an, you know, an arena and, and a, a forum for debate and a forum, you know, to try to push uh, critical thinking, if nothing else. Right? I, have, I don't think I have a truth that I would preach, right? But I, <laughs> I certainly have a method that I would preach. That's right. if, yep. if one puts it that way, right? The critical thinking, reflection, you know, don't take things. So, you know, classroom does certainly uh, offer that opportunity very much. University campus offers that opportunity very much. Um, what it was about October 17, I think it was a kind of, um, I don't know how, how to describe it as much as something which was not personal anymore, something which was, you know, outside of oneself now. You know, when, when you're talking about the classroom setting and what I may or may not do, that was a kind of a personal thing. That was a small space thing because, you know, bluntly one had more or less given up on the grander picture and just said, well, look, I do what I can within whatever realm I can, right? Um, the October uprising opened up that arena. The October, you know, events opened up and said, well, there's, you know, this is, this is now not just about me. This isn't just about my small sphere of being and interaction in a, you know, confined space of a classroom, safe space, because, you know, for me, the classroom is a safe space, whether mm. for myself or for my students, uh, the campus is a safe space. And but that opened up and, you know, kind of, broke certain barriers of fear certainly broke and I would I'm you know this is personal uh, broke certain barriers of fear and I said you know why should we be quiet about these things why not point to these things you know mm. any what way we can um and it kind of it was almost a mass uh, uh phenomenon right that you see right. so many yeah. people jump on at the same time more or less that you hadn't heard their voices before but clearly their voices were there they were just not you know in my case I I wasn't uh, invested in putting out that voice. I wasn't sure mm. it would have any impact. Who knows, right? And I still don't know if it does, but, but it opened up the arena for kind of a communal 
um, yes, yes. sharing experience, right? And just putting it out there. It's a different sphere. It's a different sphere. Is it the the thoughts that were that were in a way reserved to the classroom prior to October 17 that suddenly these these ideas that were being exchanged within the classroom, within the university, yeah. were now being exchanged on the street. Yeah. And you Absolutely. were and you saw your yourself as sort of being able to transition that 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 lecture, if you will, that, that some, dialogue, that discussion, dialogue. that yeah, 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 right, and and absolutely, and particularly because you know the student body w- w- was a big role on this uh, in the uprising, right? So yes. they took the classroom outside as well. Right. And it, it, at many points, we were playing catch up. Let's be very blunt, right? I was yeah. playing catch up with them. It was phenomenal, and mm. there was some really, it was really energizing, um, in the sense of you know certain, um, you know, the, the cliche is but they're not all cliches are bad, right? Certain taboos were broken, certain, yes. you know, kind of walls were broken, certain fears were overcome. Uh, and the things, you know, we would joke about previously in class, like, you know, I'd be teaching uh, something about Greek mythology and, you know, Mount Olympus. And I say, we have, we have a very similar structure in downtown, you know, we have 128 Zeus and Poseidon and ha, ha, <laughs> we just keep it within, right? We just maintain it within the classroom and just, you know, and some, some nervous laughter and we move on. Um, and th- that suddenly now is, you know, it- it's echoed. It's echoed across, uh, you know, the streets and the alleys and, you know, this, this kind of, def- um, let's say, rebelling against the deities, right? The, our homegrown mm. deities. That's, I always think of them that way. Um, the demigods have been, are being challenged, so, right? And, so you saw it in the philosophical context. You, well, you actually, I mean, I mean. There's some, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, in, in some contests, yeah, but not, but not, you know, castles in the air kind of philosophical context sure. or kind of, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a recurrent theme and there you are, you're seeing it. And to be honest, it was phenomenal to be part of it, um, no matter, you know, the tiny part be, or, or at least just be witness of it. Mm-hmm. Because this is, I think, I don't want to make generalizations based on just personal experience, but I, I feel that that's always, you know, it's, it's kind of a moment moment that so many were waiting for it's kind of a moment that you know when we sit around yeah. family friends you know we don't exactly praise the things that are going on we don't speak well of them right mm-hmm. i mean it's mm-hmm. not like suddenly we all decided we need to speak badly of them that's been the kind of you know uh living room con- conversations for so long suddenly those walls are you know this is no longer a private conversation this is no longer a classroom conversation this is an open conversation. And I think for me, that was, that was the, trans, you know, the, the big transformation of the, of the October uprising. I like this way of drawing it out that things that we always kept to ourselves at home. Uh-huh. And, this, and when you say that, you remind me, I think mostly of the 1980s. Right. But then also the 1990s in different ways. Without getting sort of too deep into this, but that you were afraid to even say the yes. wrong thing on the streets worrying or that name <laughs> or yeah and then yeah. i mean and i remember you know it's a silly example but i remember walking around hamra and i would i mean many of us would just use aub to get down to ic and then i was a student at acs so i would sort of sneak in at times navigate and navigate and the stairs i think were still open the stairs that go all right. the way down to acs right and i remember the syrian checkpoints and I was afraid of them. I really was yes. afraid, but I yes. didn't know why. And I don't think I really understood why until later that you're sort of drilled this at home. Don't say anything. Don't make a fu- don't even, don't look. Don't make eye contact. And I mean, make there's no there's no iPhone. There's no way to sort of get right. yourself. Yeah. You just you're on your own. You're walking your to school. Own. Yeah. So there was always this fear, and that's at home. You could talk maybe maybe Fuck. about half as lessed maybe. Fuck. But then I like the second step, which is things light, things ease up to a point that the classroom, at least at an AUB in particular, right. subjects that were deemed sensitive before were not sensitive anymore. Even right. the Lebanese Civil War was being taught. And I took a course, yes. and I remember this, that, that this, this is a hot issue, but now can be discussed, in a sa- like you said, in that safe environment. But it's at AUB. And then now... The way you're saying it resonates so much with me. You can take, you can literally take your classroom to the yes. streets of Beirut. And I saw this. I think it Absolutely. was, I think Makram Rabah and, Makram. And, Makram, and, and, certainly. and Bashar Haidar. I and saw Bashar. him in the egg. Yep. 
And I'm yeah, like, yeah. oh, they're teaching in the egg. And I made an appearance just to see this with my own eyes. The egg and a philosophy course to put together. Absolutely. And like, this is reclaiming something. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. That, and, and Makram was doing um, history of Lebanon in the egg. Right. Right. So how, I mean, right there when, you know, and, and I remember he mentioned something, you know, about, you know, history in the making and history being taught. Right. And right outside, there's something historical happening. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, and so, so you, you, be, you know, exactly as you put it, is this moving these discussions, which had their kind of parameters of safe environment and safe forms of discussion. And that's, you know, always a principle of when we're, you know, opening up various, various issues in classrooms or on campus. But now you're taking them outside and you're taking them outside, not only in terms of, you know, instigating anything. You're actually keeping up with the conversation now. The conversation is going on right. and you're yeah. trying to join it now rather than, you know, in a classroom setting where you're trying to instigate it. No, you're not. Right. And so many times yeah. I'd go down, you know, when, when you know, October, November, when we would go down, you know, almost nightly down, downtown. And most of the time I'm just in awe. I'm just sitting there listening to what's going on, listening to the chants and the discussions, you know, and all these, yes. and it was, it was mostly trying to just, tune in and keep up with these phenomenal open discussions going on. So that was for me, the big transition, definitely. For you, because this is reminding me of the positivity that it's sort of now looking back, it's hard. I mean, we're having, it's, it's funny. I'm, I'm being, I'm, these are fond memories. Yeah. That's less than a year and a half ago. Less than a year. Or, I mean, it's perhaps it was December, November, 2019. Yeah, all the way up to December, certainly. So can you, I mean, this is a hard question and I, I'm being unfair, but I want, I'm, I want your opinion. Are you able to sort of pinpoint when this feeling went from fondness to disgruntledness? Yeah. And I am, um, and I'm curious, is it, is it more to do with the blast and that sort of months later, or did it already happen that you sort of had this, maybe the negative, the negativity sort of took hold? Cause, cause for me on my side, I started feeling it, I think, in January. Yeah. And, and it was when people, and I'll say this, maybe I'll say this more carefully, when I saw violence that could not be necessarily controlled, right. regardless, of the, regardless of the reasons right. why people are pursuing mm -hmm. violence as an option, mm -hmm. regardless whether it's justified or not. That aside, I saw, I saw things that I remembered from the war, oh. and, I, and that's for me, was the red flag. And I'm wondering if that if it's if it's that or if there's other things that made you sort of hesitate and that this could be going in a in a different direction. It was um, let's call it a, draw, a long drawn out process of seeping negativity, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, I would you know I, I think you know in, in, as you said, going back to fond memories, I think the last kind of take a uh, you know pleasant was was new year's eve in downtown you know mm. we started there you know and then we went back to the family and you know so but we made a point of going there first yes. right yeah uh, and so that was you know nice we were still you know of course the the the, the let's say the impetus had dwindled a bit by then um, for various reasons but but it was still there you know people were still kind of committing to it etc i think for me um i i don't know if it was you know like you said i remember january very well and into february uh, but it, it started a bit earlier, actually. It started maybe, you know, I'd say about December started to kind of creep in a bit mm -hmm. with, you know, little, you know, inner in kind of bickering and, you know, the little divisions and the little, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, petty politics, let's call it. So, sorry, uh, is, this, is this bickering among the, op um, yes, among the protests? Absolutely. Yes, right, right, among yeah. the various groups, right? Yes, I yes. mean, that was. Uh, that was already starting to get there but you know that's fine you can overlook it and keep moving and january started also you know like you said with certain you know um we, we have memories as you said and though yeah. you know we don't want those memories to be triggered mm -hmm. right and it, it is scary uh, and you say no you know that's the no but even then for me it was still kind of all right but you know we can maybe move beyond that right it'll, it'll flare up a bit and then it'll quiet down mm -hmm. um I think late January into early February was, was for me, the, the, you know, khalas. it really started to get, although of course it was never just positive, uh, not even in October, November, December, mm -hmm. nor just mm -hmm. negative later. It was always, you know, a mishmash and it's kind of a pendulum swinging between, yay, it's a great day. No, it's a horrible day. No, it's a great day. Right. right and, you know, right. it's ups and downs the whole time. 
but it started to, you know, the pendulum kind of started to get stuck more and more on the negative side as we went into 2020, certainly, you know, with, with the, uh, the new cabinet and the new, you know, what happened in February and, you know, just yesterday, I think was the one year anniversary, right? Beautiful anniversary. Uh, oh, yeah, February 11, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, because I remember that day we were, you know, we were um, different, you know, areas around the, the entrances to parliament, right? And then, mm. and, you know, the gatherings and demonstrations. And that for me was like, I, you know, we were there, but we weren't there really hopeful because we knew it was a fait accompli. It was going to be done. It was going to be done. And so you start, to, I, I felt what was, you know, what we started to lose already in December into January, February was the, the sense that this would actually make a difference, right? Whereas for me in October, November, mm -hmm. it felt like, oh, this is making a difference. This is definitely making a difference. But it, you keep going, you know, you keep going with it, but you're more and more kind of getting tired, you're getting burnt out, you know, you're... So it started to seep in slowly. Um, so, so when it was and, no longer within... I'm sorry to interrupt, but is it... No, no, is it that Is that things were not in your control was it that the the narrative was moving away from the protest movement because i because going back to the initial no, sort that's of a this, good way the, the truth that you described which i right. i love the way you described it that the, there's this sort sort of battle for battle against right. fiction and preserving right. fact was that seeping in as well that suddenly you had other stories and other narratives that were not registering with the protest movement itself that's, I think that's a very good way of putting it, Ronnie, definitely. Mm. And I think there was this, this um, not only narratives that weren't registering, but certain narratives that were also kind of being produced by the movie, or not, not, not the movie, but by certain, you know. So you had competing never narratives even within, without, um, you know, some harking back to older narratives, some, some debunking the new narratives, right? And of course, we had that right from the beginning, all these storytellings about what was going on, but it was, yeah. you know, whatever, right? Uh, but yes, so, and, and I think there was also a return to, to the narratives that you had been fighting against, right? To, a return to, you know, the, like the fait accompli, what happened, say, with the cabinet formation, you know, uh, voices coming up and saying, let's give them a chance, and no, no, this is the best, and, you know, khalas, you know, we, we and you, you, you get also this, these narratives of, you know, what have these movements done, you know, we've, we've really harmed the country, we've done this, and, and so, it, it, it's, it becomes very kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like these kind of moments of tension with these different, uh, you know, again, to use the term narrative for lack of a better word. Um, and, you're, and you're struggling and you're trying to say, no, 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 that's not what happened. That's not what's happening, right? Uh, let's make sure we continue with the initial, what we thought was happening. You know, right. I, I make no claim for truth, but that was something there. There was something there. So is know? it that they were st that? Not, I know that we're being careful because it's hard to kind of pinpoint right. it. At sort of, but but How, that, what do you call it? Yeah, but was is it that the initial days? So October 18, 19, 20 was no longer part of the story. That it was I sort would of say all the way to November was not. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. you know all that initial period mm -hmm. seems to have become almost a separate chapter. You're entering. It, it, you know, yeah. So there was almost, a, it, you know, a, a, a discontinuity right. uh, with with the initial kind of push. Um, but you're yeah. you're you're a professor, and you're you're lecturing while all this is happening, and you're able to sort of. <laughs> I mean, it's hard. I, you oh, know what? Wow. I can't imagine what it's like to try to try to do this it's during phenomenal. crisis. Yeah, I, I think you know what? This is a generation of people that will have these strange stories they tell their children and grandchildren later. So you have no idea. <laughs> you have no clue. But but you're trying. You're trying to you're trying to retain your profession while things are falling apart, and you succeed. Absolutely. And then this COVID crisis emerges, and everything That's goes online. So for me. I had the luxury, and looking back now, this is a real luxury, of doing these episodes in person prior to wow. prior to COVID. So I would actually, you know, I, and I love doing this. I have to admit, maybe there are some that I don't necessarily want to do in person, but 99%, I would take any sort of, uh, I would love to at least, because there's a, there's a, there's a, there's something special about the intimacy of, of being alone in a room and the microphones. I think you can kind of, do a lot of things that it's hard to do online but sure. that said 
I, I like everyone went on zoom and, and so we're, we're doing this on zoom during the country's curfew and lockdown, but I don't think I can imagine what it's like to be a professor teaching a group on zoom violence escalating yeah. prospects diminished diminished and this is pre-blast this is just yes for the months leading to the yes. blast and I, I i you know i don't really get the chance to ask professors this question much did you see your students struggling the way that maybe did it take you back to your earlier years in other words this uncertainty this anxiety this financial sort of erosion and and economic i mean real economic crises individual level and and right. families and, and national, national. That, and i that for me was the 1980s and i remember right rolling up the old lira and trying to have enough money to go buy something and sort of like the rolls and rolls of Khamsin lira just to go get a bottle of water. So things were, things were spiraling. And I just, for me, I had this anxiety, not a professor, just talking and, and listening to activists and people on the ground that there was a worry that I had not remembered really until I sort of thought back. It's like, no, this is, this is the civil war. Did, and we're not using that word because there, it, the country is not in a civil not war. Not at war. Yeah, so we don't use it. But minus the violence that you associate with war, minus the shells, the actual minus shelling. The, yeah, minus the tank and minus the going to the bunker, minus the horrible stuff that we lived through. Did, did, did that creep in? Did you, did you see sort of, did you feel? the earlier sort of 1980s memories coming back or were they irrelevant that no, 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 this is something else to you. And I'm saying it from my side, I, I felt it. 1980s yeah. was, was entering my mind regularly. I'm curious from your side. Um, to be very honest, uh, I, it didn't flash back to the 1980s as much as to something that, I don't know how this is gonna sound, but could potentially be worse. Right. And I don't know mm. what could be worse than the 1980s. But, but I mean, and this is probably because of the, you know, the, the memories plus the fear plus where this is going and the uncertainty and everything. But, but also a part of it was, you know, growing up, you know, being born. I'm, I'm, I was born right at the, you know, beautiful timing of entry into the Civil War. Right. Uh, April, Thomas, April 13, 1975. Right. Oh, oh, no, no, I was born. No, I, I was born before that. But, you know, I was yeah, yeah. too young to remember anything right. pre-war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, what a, what a birthday, though. That would be great. You know? like, <laughs> oh, no, no. Fortunately, not that. And he was born and the country collapsed. <laughs> and then it went, it went to hell. <laughs> no, no. So fortunately, I don't take that burden of responsibility. <laughs> but, you know, so for me, there's nothing. It's not like, you know, uh, the older generation who have a reference point pre-war, right? Mm, so yeah, we, we yeah, grew yeah. up within that context. And I, you know, as, as horrible as this word will sound, it was normalized, right? Right. Yes. So, yes. you know, particularly the 80s. That's what we remember mostly, right? The 80s. Yeah. Then we get the post-war era, right? And then for, you know, for, for what it's worth, but it was a post-war era, um, you know, through the 90s, through the 2000s. And that now is our reality. That's, you know, yeah. so now what you're getting is, is I feel what our parents got in the civil war, the idea of pre-war war. Now we have right. war pre-war, right? right? So now we have both. We have more than them because we have the war, we have the post-war, and now we're sensing, is this, and you know, what is this? And what you said is, is very true. And, you know, to bring in a bit of our, you know, philosophical uh, you know, background and, um, about, you know, well, we don't have tanks, we don't have shelling. Hobbes, you know, maybe not the best reference, but in Lebanon, he's a, you know, he would be a great reference. Thomas Hobbes and the Leviathan, right, political philosopher, um, says, you know, war isn't just the actual fighting. Preparation for war and fight is fighting. Uh, sorry, preparation for war is itself an act of war. Mm. Intention of war is itself an act of war, mm -hmm. right? Prepping and revving for war is itself an act of, you don't actually have to be engaged in war, right? And then he has this, you know, little addendum that he says, all other times are peace, which basically leaves very little when really, right. you think about yeah. it, right? Yeah. So it, it is warlike uh, in, in that sense you mentioned. And I think for us, it's because we have a memory and of, of the war itself, but we also have a memory of post-war for what it's worth. 
it, it just confounds the fear, at least, you know, personal experience. Add to it the fact that we are immobile. We are locked up. Right. We've, been, we've been in lockdown since yeah. March. That, for me, makes it even worse because you're mm -hmm. confined. Everything is collapsing around you. Like you said, the financial erosion, the political, forget it. There's nothing there, right? Everything going horribly wrong outside. And yes. you're just sitting <laughs> and waiting. Yeah. What's going to happen, right? And you have so little control over it. Um, and you mentioned, you know, the, the idea of moving classes, to, uh, you know, and, you know, things going crazy outside and you're sitting just to, to add a bit of, you know, dark humor to it. In fall, I was actually teaching utopian thought, right? A course on, you know, ideal states of existence, ideal political visions, and then boom, everything starts to, you know, <laughs> and, and it was so strange to go into class and discuss, you know, great ideal visions of, of utopian societies and whatnot. And, you know, and how do you how do you keep a straight face while, while teaching that or, or debating that or discussing that or even, you know, philosophical, rational discourse when all around you things go into anything but rational discourse. Right. Right. Um, but so all of the, I think all of our, you know, all these layers put down together is just, you know, and we, we were uh, earlier saying, you know, it really drains. It really drains because you, you feel helpless in, in, to some extent. Um, personally, you feel also responsible to some extent. You feel, you know, um, that's that's like actually what you up. just said. What you just said, I never thought of it. That's exactly how I feel. I'm glad you said this. The, the mix, right? The, the the struggle of all these. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 out of control. Yet you feel responsible. Yes. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's a it's it's a tiring feeling. It's a tiring feeling, because you know, it's a sense of responsibility of not guilt. It's not guilt in the sense, you know, one is a culprit, but one is responsible if one, you know, doesn't step up, doesn't. And then at the same time, one steps up and it's almost like nothing happens. So it's, it's a struggle yeah. between this helplessness, right? You keep trying or you keep, you know, of course, as, as part of a greater, hopefully a, a group and majority, one hopes, one keeps trying to no avail, but you can't sit down because that's even worse. And so it's this constant, you know, I, I don't want to deal with this. And so many times, I'm sure you, you, you know, you get to that verge as I do, as many of our friends do and say, you know what, this isn't yeah. worth it. But that doesn't last like, I don't know if it even lasts a day because then it, it eats at you. It nags right. at you and say, no, 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 you know. So Hany, yeah. you are, you are describing, I think you're putting, you're putting it in a way that is, it's resonating. And I never thought of it this way that you're breaking free you're euphoric for a few months you're sharing knowledge and you're debating outside openly. the walls openly and then within maybe weeks you're confined to yourself and you're looking at a screen Absolutely. and that's it's almost like the whole fairy tale or whatever it is yeah it just it just disappears and snatched suddenly, away from you snatched away it's and snatched. this this almost feels more like a nightmare and i think actually yeah. nightmare may, may be too kind sometimes to describe what we're going through <laughs> but that good. that kind of dramatic change in such a short period of time i think could drive anyone insane yet yet we seem to be level-headed enough and you my friend are i think increasingly sort of pushing online to drive the point home that Focus on what matters and focus on truth. So did this sort of re-energized that, that was maybe on the street in November, December, January, mm -hmm. that's now online. Is that sort of making up for it? That now we have this vast space where we know these people, some, we know a lot of these people and the ones we don't, we're sort of confronting regularly. Is this sort of the next stage that we can't be on the street there's no one to talk to right now in, in sort of in person so we're we're enraged and we're letting it all out on twitter <laughs> is that really it, it, yeah i i from my person i would say absolutely mm. absolutely i i mean my, my you know whatever it is we're doing on twitter or other you know media there is is just saying look we haven't gone away right. we're not on the streets we can't be on the streets right? For, for things beyond anybody's control. This is global, right? Mm -hmm. We haven't gone away and our voices shouldn't go away. And, mm -hmm. and the attempts to keep 
spotlighting any portion of truth we can, no matter how small, right? To, to you know, uh, just keep keep nagging, right? It's, 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 sometimes it feels futile. And sometimes, you know, and I catch these kind of discussions online saying, you know, this is not going to do anything. Well, not doing anything is not going to do anything either. <laughs> right? I mean, you have, you have a sure bet of not doing anything if you don't do anything. You have some probability of doing something by doing this at least. Because yeah. right now we don't, yeah, you're right. We have no alternative right now. We're, we're cooped up, we're stuck. And the other thing for me is being cooped up gets this going even more, right? Because the, the right. day is slow. Yes, yes. Right? I spend more time on, on Twitter than I would have ever done in the past because, yeah. you know, in the past you're out and about, you're socializing. And a lot of it, as you, you said it at the beginning about venting, a lot of it is vented out during the day in our conversations with our colleagues, with our friends, with our family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by the end of the day, you've kind of let it out. You're, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe echo something right, right. now. This is the, your, you know, this is your only space. And so I it's all of these components coming together and, and you know, you're sitting down, you, you know, this has been eating, a, you know, a small idea, something you read in the morning has been eating at you yes. and you let it go and you do what you need to do working from home. And then in the evening you read something, you're like, no, no, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going <laughs> to let this pass. No. Right. <laughs> because it's been all day carving yeah. away at you. You know, something very, very strange happened. And there's an episode that's going to come out prior to this episode. So prior to right. this conversation, it would have been sort of after the fact I, I, I was, similar to what you're describing, there was a lot of BS. And I mean, there's always going to be that anyway, whether you're involved or not, okay. it's there. It's not, I mean, it's, it exists with or without sort of that participation, but it, it went up going back to the last few days, right. sort of it spiked after Lukman Slim's assassination. So spiked is a good word. Yeah. And I, I found myself going into this sort of <coughs> autopilot scenario. I was just working working on trying to celebrate him in an eloquent way without diminishing the, the murder. So the right. keeping focusing on the crime and just trying to honor that, that this is a man who paid the ultimate price, Absolutely. period. Forget all the WikiLeaks, Absolutely. forget all the clips that are being shared and, and perhaps distorted, perhaps not. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So I'm in that kind of war zone, whatever it is, this tweet war. And then... Rina Hariri. I don't know her. She's, a, she's on Twitter. She's, uh, the, she's the niece of Rafi Hariri. Bahia okay. Hariri's daughter. Okay. Never met her. Never met her. Oh, Twitter. Sends me a message. And uh, she says, you're not alone. Take it easy. You're not alone. Calm down. And you know what? It's like, huh, Twitter does both now. It drives you insane and then there's that other <laughs> sort of side it. to it. It's like, just, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, it's like, I, I live here. Why, what am I doing on Twitter? And I catch myself doing this stupid, I'm taking a shower and I want to know what is on Twitter and I'll reach the phone from wow. the shower. This is, this is probably a form of addiction that we all have. And it maybe sure. it goes up whenever there's it, a crisis, maybe. It fluctuates. It, yeah, exactly. Or you shouldn't be doing it. You're waiting at a traffic light. Sort of but yeah, right. you shouldn't. I mean, these are things you should not do, and then you're doing it right. because of the chaos. I, I completely agree. These are the things you should be exchanging among peers, among friends, among maybe just strangers yeah. who are that it should be done in real life, yet it's substituted online. Did the blast skyrocket things for you? Mm. Meaning that Absolutely. suddenly it's not just COVID, it's not just crisis, it's half the city is torn. And now it's it's even dangerous to live here. Live here. Forget that if you're involved or not. Just living in the city can just being you know, here. Being here is that when it became almost a, like a, a war, if you will, to make sure that this does not go unchecked and that this is this does not become part of the Lebanese history that we're familiar with. It's just things that happen. There's no accountability, and this is this is maybe trying to battle that as much as you can. Is, is that Absolutely. how you saw it? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. That was, that was um, it, the way you put it is, is, you know, very well said. It was, it was, you know, a declaration of war, not in the, not in the weapons sense. I'm a pacifist, mm. by the way. So, you know, definitely not, but yes, in, in the sense of, you know, I don't know how to express it other than say, really? Like, 
<laughs> like really yeah. seven years that, that stuff has been there right i mean and and because i think for me like what really hit me with with the uh the october 4 sorry the august 4 explosion is we knew they were horrific right we knew they were bad mm-hmm. we knew they were malicious we knew yeah. they were calculated we knew that right but we didn't realize the depth of it we didn't yeah. realize how horrific they can be right and it, and i and i'm i'm almost positive about this every single person somehow was impacted by that blast whether directly right of course you know we know very well how many were directly impacted i don't live near the blast but of course it impacted it you know you know because the radius the blast radius sure. was, yeah. but you know i had i know i you know i had students uh, who were who were severely injured? I had colleagues, I had workmates who were severely injured. Yeah. And as you said, and it, so there is that personal. But even if you put that person, it's not because I had colleagues. No, no, no. It's just, is it really, you know? And, and it's phenomenal that you you know that that moment that you know the, the the explosion just really drove it home. I think I hope to all of us how horrible things have become. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Before, before that, we realized that, but it was, it was I don't want to use the words, you know, in, in lightly, but it's theoretical in the sense that, oh, okay, you know, they, they, they uh, smuggled their, you know, uh, wealth outside of the country. Theoretical. There's mm-hmm. nothing mm-hmm. that tangible that, you, that impacts you directly. We know, yeah, they're holding, human, you know, people's savings. They've, they've stolen people's savings. Yes, but it's, it's all out there, right? This isn't, this is not money. This isn't, you know, I know money is a big thing, you know, of course it impacts a lot of people, but what I'm trying to say is this is death. This is a weapon of mass destruction, right? And as horrific as all the other things were, that was just, there's no word, right? And it was just right there. And then of course the, 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 the more horrific if anything is ever more horrific than the explosion itself, is their reaction to it. It's what they've right. done about it, which is yeah. absolutely nothing. Six months, right? And you, you, you know, you, you recently you had you know guests and you were talking about the markers and and you know I was listening. I'm saying that's it. We we keep markers. We have markers because we live in a country that you know. So let's sorry. go back. Yeah. No, 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 no. Let's go back. To, let's go back to mythology. And I'm going to, as a, as an as an idiot, I know nothing about philosophy, so I'm going to ask you to help me through this. I mean, you you put as much philosophy as you can into this because I'm, I, I don't know enough. But I, I I'll ask you about the. There's this false narrative that everyone is taught, everyone believes, and it's there's different narratives depending on where you live or maybe how you. It actually could be simply. What what confession at times you're born into could also lead to a certain narrative by default in this country. So you have those competing ideas, and they're all sort of uh, they're they're variations of falsehood. And then you have the knowledge. There's sort of it's it's accepted knowledge that that that, that this was here for seven years. We don't almost exactly how much was there we know roughly how much was not there how it got there right? we know how yes. it got there we actually probably know even certain names at this point that are affiliated with our neighborhood our neighbor to the east yes so we have enough background sort of for the average citizen to sort of understand put, pieces. put some pieces together right so there's enough fact available we know that it wasn't the israelis although that was sort of taking hold the, maybe the first few hours, first few days, we know it wasn't them. We know that it wasn't sort of just a simple welding accident gone wrong. We know that it was there was a storage of ammonium nitrate in the port, very dangerous, and if set off, could destroy half the city, and it did. We also know more recently, it's the last maybe day or two, yes, absolutely that, that there was another bomb Four. in the making. <laughs> yeah. And the Germans were even, <laughs> it's rare, rare for Germans to actually say this these days. They're like, World War II. <laughs> yes. I mean, they, they're like, we haven't, we haven't had to deal with this since World War II. Like, what is this doing here? Yeah. So, so they maybe spared us another disaster. So this fact. And we also are unable 
to even have a minutia of accountability that would Nothing. use those facts. So, and I'm going to ask you as carefully as I can here, low level detainees, not enough for this kind of massive explosion. Uh, a judge who takes sort of maybe weeks or months off for various reasons, maybe returning in the next few days, maybe may have already mm. sort of lined up in whatever. There, there's, that, there's that silliness to the story. And I think silliness may be the right word, that this is a show. It's not, yes. it's not serious. It's not, a charade. It's a charade. charade. Yeah. Uh, there's no attempt at inviting any international inspectors to really get to the bottom of this. Okay, so we know that there's a, some form of a cover-up here and that nobody is going to jail and nobody's going to be held to account. And then there's the citizenry who's trying to save the country from itself and trying to sort of hone in that all these people who knew about it and did nothing about it, all of them are guilty, all of them. And I think, I think the appetite has increased for the sort of these, everyone that sort of had some knowledge and did nothing about it should be in trouble. Absolutely. Now, if, if let's say the average Lebanese today across communities and across political ideologies can come to that conclusion on their own, in your mind, as a philosopher, as somebody who's trying to maybe offer some wisdom to an idiot like me, <laughs> how, how are you able to describe this dilemma? And I ask you in the Lebanese context, but I'm asking you more in the human experience, what is it about this country that prevents the largest non-nuclear blast in modern hist in, in history, history, history to go unchecked? If if we have that, if we have the data, and if we have the, yeah. is it is it simply that Lebanon is configured in a way that prevents this from happening? Is there something that is in the system that is denying this from happening? Is it us? that we're just, we're not able to deliver collective justice without it destroying the country? Destroying. So from your side. I would say, you know, from a philosophical, you know, rational trying to make sense of things as you were, you know, presenting that beautiful kind of capture of, of the dilemma that is called living in Lebanon. <laughs> uh, the, the one person that snuck up and he's been sneaking up because I did my master's thesis on him would be Nietzsche. And, mm. you know, he snuck up, whispered something left because he, he's annoying like that. And it, it's basically <laughs> something he said in, uh, well, a number of his works, but certainly in uh, Beyond Good and Evil, when he's talking about what he calls the fictions of logic. Uh, and mm. So, you know, without going into too much detail, basically, you know, the, the notion of truth and untruth in Nietzsche are, are elements that one uses or one values based on their um, usefulness rather than, so truth in itself is not valuable if it's not useful. Right. And mm, so yeah. in, in that sense, sometimes untruth is much more useful. And so he says mm. something that I'm paraphrasing, something to the effect of, you know, without the fictions of logic, we would not survive. Right. Without and the so fictions of logic. Logic. So, you know, mm. the world isn't logical. Uh, right. It is not true that if A, then B, but we, we hang on to those fictions. We value those fictions and they work. Right. Mm. Because the next time I want to make my record, I put the water on the fire. If I do that, I will get it to boil and I'll have my coffee, right? So it's a functional fiction. We have so many of them in Lebanon. Oh. We have so many functional fictions in Lebanon. Truth mm. is not necessarily valued. And that's the only, my, my only response right there in the sense that just because something is true doesn't mean I will necessarily subscribe to it. And this is, for me, horrific. What are the conditions some... then for, for us to reach that level? Because let's say this is, a, this is something that you can apply anywhere among right. any, any, any community. It doesn't matter. Outside yeah. Lebanon, this could happen. But what is it about Lebanon that reaches us to that? that, that, that that's the conclusion, that the false logic outweighs the benefits of truth. Years and years of narratives that have and you, you mentioned it in your summation or you know, the illustration that you presented is that we cannot have accountability, justice without imploding or exploding. Right. Right. 
And that's the constant narrative. That is the constant narrative being thrown at us that don't go there, don't go there. Look at, look at the narrative that's been very lively since the assassination of Luqman Slim, yeah. right? Look at how many narratives have been developed of, you know, or you're attacking a whole portion of the community. No, or you're, you know, you're doing the, no, right? But it's a constant, um, I would say fear mongering. It's a constant, you know, re, re emphasis on the same narratives of, even if that is true, don't say it. Even, even if it's true, even if that's true, don't say it. Even right. if it's yes. true, don't say it. Even yeah. if it's true, don't subscribe to it. And you mentioned something earlier about, you know, growing up in the 80s. We had the same thing, right? Even if, you know, the, the Syrian occupation is an occupation, don't call it that. Yeah, yeah. Don't call it that. Even if the war is war, don't call it that. Call it Ahdir. Right. Right? It's, it's nicer. It's, you know, it's, you know. You know, sorry, the two-year war. Really? The two-year war? The one that lasted 15 years? You mean that one? <laughs> right? Like, but, but we have these narratives. We have the, and, then, and then you get narratives that, of course, you know, bringing in, you know, the relation of truth and power always, right? And, you know, without digging up too much, uh, you know, the philosophical baggage with that. But there is, there is a direct relation of truth and power in the sense of power decides the narrative. And the shifting powers decide the shifting narratives. Now, our problem in Lebanon is power is shared. And so the narrative is shared. So you don't get one right. narrative. <laughs> right? right? Depends where you go. Right? Oh, that's I, that's I go really visit, interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I go visit my, my extended relatives in, you know, in a certain part of Lebanon. It's a different narrative. Right? And you're definitely not going to be invited nor encouraged to, to you know, critique or deny that narrative. You go to another part of Lebanon, it's a different narrative and so on and so forth. The narrative is much more important than the fact, than the truth. To go back briefly to October, um, and I was, you know, visiting, again, I don't want to point to areas and, you know, so as not to, you know, stigmatize anyone or, or badmouth anyone, but in that area I was in, they were absolutely pro the uprising, right? Very much engaged, very, mm. Mm. except don't mention their local feudal lord. And he said it to me explicitly. And I'm looking at him and I thought, yeah. But I thought it was, you know, kill them, yani kill them, right? Isn't, isn't it everyone? He's like, yeah, yeah, of course it's everyone, except I'm thinking, how does that sentence make sense in his mind, right? How does it make sense that everyone except? If it's everyone except, then it's not everyone. Now go to another area, you'll get the same narrative. The reasoning is always going to be the same because he's different, because he did this, because he did that. And I'm almost sure, I don't want to say I'm absolutely sure, Ronnie, but I'm almost sure they don't believe what they're saying. Oh, you, you, okay. So, so that's but it interesting. It doesn't matter. But so, it doesn't so, matter. Truth so, has no. So, in other words, the fact, okay, that's, that's, you know, that's really interesting. So, the date, the truth is maybe absorbed and it, it yeah. doesn't, doesn't translate to anything other than just has n no meaning. It, it's to, useless. It's useless. You know, I like, like the way you described it, this sort of shared false narrative, but the, yeah. the, the winner is sort of diluted the way Lebanon is configured and therefore you get competing falsehoods. Absolutely. It's so, competing, yeah. but yet coexisting, right? They're right. competing, but they're coexisting because they've, they've partitioned the, the intellectual space, so to speak, rather than the geographical, right? I mean, you know, they, they have mm -hmm. their own mm -hmm. spheres uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's fine. And they've yeah. managed to occupy those spheres side by side, very much like they've managed to occupy the seats in power side by side, right? I mean, you know, they're not, they're not foes. Right. I mean, they're, you know, they're partners, they're partners in crime and their narratives are partners in crime. So as somebody who's born in the early 1970s, who only has bad memories by default, because the post-war years are not the shining years, even if there were periods of, I mean, the some, 90s, yeah. there was some, some here, there were snippets. And then maybe in the early 2000s, there was some as well. Sure. After the July 2006 war, there was some. Done but some is dramatically outweighed by bad. And that includes other wars, that includes near brink of civil war, that th this is just, let alone the assassinations, which we're reminded of just a few days ago. So Absolutely. all of this, and then this is, the, this is your life in Lebanon. Would you be able to step away from this and put the onus on on groups that have hijacked the worst version of falsehood, but is most beneficial 
to para to paralyzing the system. And I'll ask this carefully without going too deep into the Hezbollah. I hear you. Because I think we can have that conversation and it's being had all over the place. It's being had online as right. sort of 24 seven, it's on TV. Right. So Hezbollah, we can maybe put it, put it in its place, at least in terms of this, in this context. Is it groups that are at least able to survive better in this kind of configuration, whether that's the, in, in earlier years, the Assad regime was able to sort of, in a way, somehow macromanage the false narratives to their advantage. And it wasn't an occupation that happened in 1976. It took about 14 years until they solidified. But those are 14 years of very patiently absorbing. Maneuvering maneuvering and when there's this sort of challenge to authority it's sort of getting rid of it and then there's this occupation but an occupation that was not wasn't necessarily just soldiers and it wasn't just wasn't that no you there wasn't there was a the soldiers were the lesser part soldiers were the lesser part yeah there was this paranoia that the syrian version of history is the correct one <laughs> yes it's muhabarat is that at least is that a is the burden there that the story, the narrative, that it ended up in this terrain? And Hezbollah may be a more recent version of that kind of to trying to steer the narrative away from truth. Look, man, Slim died in some mysterious way that nobody will ever know. Okay. And that's and it. And it's sort of that's it. And that's now they have the gun. They can, they're not, they're not pointing at every critic. They don't need to point at every critic. Of course. They've hijacked the narrative. And whether or not people say, no, it's you, they're like, it's not us. The Syrians, in a way, did the same thing, maybe in a more collective way, collective punishment, and in a, in a regime level yeah. and countrywide. And that was a real sort of, it was not, a, it was not, it's not nearly as sophisticated and perhaps not as, uh, well entrenched, entrenched as Hezbollah, yes. yeah, but they were still able to at least for 15 years manage this country, or mismanage it. But this is by the gun, this is by intelligence. Are we living in that era still? So 30, 31 years later, we're still in that kind of truth is available. I'm going to stick to my guy because the truth is getting in the way of my security. Yes. And then that's I, the I, I fully believe so. That's the Lebanese story right there. I, be, I fully believe so. And this is because it's been so long, you know, long, as you said, it's going for so long. You can go back to the 80s. You had, you know, but it, I always bracket out the pre-Taif because, you know, war, you know, as, as the saying goes, all is fair in love and war, right? It's a horrible statement, but, you know, it's, it's there. So, you know, the war is, I don't expect sense in war. It was nonsense. Mm. It was mm. absurd. It was, it was horrific. But then you go, as you said, and the, the pretense of, of, of a nation building post Taif, right? For, for whatever it's worth, the, the warlords decided, you know, well, somebody helped them decide that, you know, you've had enough. I yeah. don't think they had actually had enough. But somebody <laughs> said, you have had enough, all right? right? And so, you know, 1990, 1991 onwards, you start to get a semblance. Um, I always think of it in terms of the political equivalent of the emperor's new clothes. Right, you know the story of the emperor's new yes. clothes. But yeah, yeah. This is now the political equivalent of a country. It's not, but you know, it's it's, it's an emperor's yeah. new clothes. Really, yeah. there's no country. Um, right. It's a you know cooperation. It's a you know various managers change and various power structures change and various narratives, and it works because it it has no intention of paying homage to truth. Right. It mm. works because yeah. it has it has an intention of survivalism. It has an intention of look at this. You know, th these are the same people, literally. It's, it's not figurative. I mean, these are the same people of the 80s still, you know, fighting over power and fighting over, you know, mysterious ministerial positions or, you know, a portion of the wealth or whatever. So yeah. it's not even figurative. It is exactly them. Right. And mm -hmm. it's just a continue, which means they've survived. They've done a good job at surviving. Right. Right. Yes. And, yes. And, and their clan now recognizes that my survival is dependent on the continued survival of X. And so what truth you bring me, I don't care. And 
to, to go a bit more personal, Ronnie, I mean, you know, as growing up in the wartime era, obviously I was fully in, entrenched in that. I also, you know, subscribe to a particular clan. I also subscribe to a particular, you know, deity on earth, right? And so I'm familiar with that. Fortunately, I, I, you know, I had the opportunity to step out and, and see it from outside for, for a few years. And you um, step, stepping out meaning stepping out of the thought or stepping out of the country? Of the country. Oh, you left. Okay. So you left the country for a bit. Geographically, before. physically. Yes, yes, yes. Physically. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and that was my saving grace, to be very honest. Uh, you know, and, and then you come and you, then you start to see things from a different perspective, right? Um, the, the idea is I, I know what it means to subscribe to that. I mean, personally. I subscribe to that narrative for a few years of my life. Mm. Personally, mm. I actually believe that, you know, our, and the hour, of course, you know, you know, you, you fill in that gap, whichever community you're referring to, our continued existence depends on X or Y or Z. Yes, yes, we know how bad they are. Yes, we know how, you know, horrible they can be, but, right? And it's always this, but so-and-so. There's always a justification, no right. matter what you say, right? right. Uh, and and, and, and it, as you said, it's, it's basic, question of survival it's that basic we're not talking about social security we're not talking about you know a, a, a dignified life we're not just life that's it right pure survival and they've convinced us that that's how it works that's an additive that works truth does not matter how have they convinced us as you said go back to any as many markers as you want what's been done nothing doesn't matter doesn't matter right as you said you go on you know media or social media or, or or family gatherings and people say yeah it's most likely this person behind that person's death or most likely this this person behind that particular event in that particular area you know i'm not saying that means it's true or not i'm saying people are willing to talk about possible explanations right so yes yeah, right so let's it call comes them out that. it actually does come yes, out yeah yes. yeah, yeah. It, and it comes which out which means there's a thought yeah. process right right, right? That, they sit down you know whether around whatever it is they enjoy having together and they put the pieces together Ah, oh, yeah if you think about it there's that piece that fits well with that piece so they say it doesn't matter samir asir doesn't matter right george Howe doesn't matter right sorry Muhammad Shada doesn't you know and now Luqman, so the narrative is there and then you yeah. can go back, of course, to the to the to the seventies, and you can go back to the eighties, and you can go back to the nineties, right? And we and what I what I perhaps find most frustrating is that I don't think there's a single person in Lebanon who would say who or rather would have an issue if any of us says not a single investigation ever led anywhere. True, and you're fine with that, right? Yes, oh. yes. So that's so, a given now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a given. We've normalized that. We've normalized that investigations don't go anywhere. We've normalized that we won't find out the truth. This is the greatest narrative against truth. The greatest narrative against truth is to convince Ronnie and Hani and everyone that even if you were to find the truth, pointless. Billy, say, all right, then. I mean, I don't know how much the budget was at the end. This tribunal. Yes. And yes, how much money was great spent? Example. I mean, I don't know. Great how, example. Yeah. And you know what? It did at the end give us a thousand page report. So there sure. is there is something there. There's an outcome. There's a and, verdict. And nothing. Doesn't matter. Right. And, and that's the narrative that's that's constantly kind of, you know, emphasized. And so when you and I and everybody says, but we need to find out what's, you know, what happened in the Beirut port. How many people will come up and say, all right, suppose you find out. Then? Does, does knowing the truth in the long run make it easier to fix this problem? So we now know, unless you're willingly, unless you're actively denying the tribunal's report, we can safely say that there is one Hezbollah operative who's guilty. So that's something that we have a report and we have a verdict. Can't really, I mean, it, challenging that aside, yeah. there's, there's information that's been given to us and it's available. Yet nothing happened. Uh, the port blast. You know, I, I always point because the port is right here. Wow. 
it's right here. Wow. And my I don't like to show this apartment too much because sometimes it's like Still. it's yeah, there's some, wow. you know, it's wow. it's beaten up badly. But but that this this horrible incident it's happens. Right and you know what? Two hundred people die. How many yeah. thousands are injured? Hundreds of Homeless. thousands lose their homes. Right. So there's we have, these are facts. Th these are facts, and and we were able to collect enough data about what happened. So long term, long term. I mean, it doesn't mean in the maybe not in the maybe not in the next few years. I'm meaning down the road. Long, long term. Long, long term. Maybe past our our experience on this planet. Does having this data available at least offer some foundation for the future? And, the, and, and is truth important when it comes to rebuilding and, and re, re, re <laughs> forget rebuilding, building right. I mean, a country, building, building yeah. a country, starting somewhere, yeah. starting somewhere and going back to what you said, which is Ta'if for you and for most of us, I think, mm -hmm. post Ta'if is the nation building exercise right. that, that was problematic at best. But, but having the truth about what the Syrians did, we know what the Israelis did. We know uh, enough about what the Americans did in 1958. Right. We have enough information about what Libya, what Kazefi did right. to Musa Sadr. So we know, we know enough things that we can build from. Does having this allow us to build later? That maybe, maybe long-term we see this era as one where narrative was hijacked by the most abnormal uh, period of Lebanon's history and regional conflict really shut this country down for a chapter but then we'll be able to use that later and say this is what we did and this is what was wrong and this is here here's the data or is it any is there any use for knowing these things or or Absolutely. is it is it sort of a Lebanon is doomed regardless so whether you get the truth or not this country is on its way out <laughs> We have to get the truth. It's, this is, you know, for me, it's, you cannot not get the truth. And this is where it gets kind of significantly important for me to distinguish between the purpose. And this is, you know, why get the truth? And it is not about, and, you know, and this is a kind of counter counter narrative, right? Mm. No, truth is not dangerous, right? Truth is not dangerous. Truth is the only way you can get out of this vicious cycle that we've been, you know, tumble drying around for God knows how long because we have not been allowed to say, look, that is the truth, reconciliation, and move on. Everyone wants to move on. Right. Who doesn't want to move on? But you cannot move on when you're continuously stuck within the same cycle of narratives. How can you move on? and drag the same narratives that you had in the 1980s with you into the 2020s for the love of, I mean, you know, we have yeah. people, right now you have people who are about 20 years old and, you know, and, and Makram, I think once gave this example about, you know, history uh, teaching and, you know, we inadvertently, we don't realize, we give an example about, you know, say the, the first Gulf War and then you realize no one in this room even knows what I'm talking about, do you? Yeah. <laughs> right? Because right. there's a disconnect. So, yes. you know, we, we've gone so far, but these narratives are constantly with us. It, we, you know, they, they grew roots in the 70s and the 80s into mm. the post if as you said. And so for me, no, we have to find the truth. We have to, I, as you said, it may have absolutely no impact now, definitely. But if you do not have it, then there's no, there's zero chance of moving forward. Having it gives us a glimpse, having it gives us a hope of moving forward. Maybe not now, as you said, beyond our time on this planet and in this universe, sure. But it has to have, that's the only seed that you can, you know, um, I'm, I'm just speaking on, I remembered one of my uh, favorite uh, fictional authors, science fiction authors who, who does a great job of kind of connecting sociology, philosophy and whatnot. Uh, um, uh, Frank Herbert, Frank Herbert, he wrote the Dune series. In, in oh, one of yeah, the, yeah, yeah, of course. Phenomenal, yes. right? Yes. It's phenomenal. And yeah. one of the same of Paul Moeddin, the, you know, the main character, right, Paul Mu'addib, is respect, to tr uh, respect for truth comes close to being the basis of all morality, right? It's just a respect for it. Hmm. Just respect it. And don't, you know, don't take this truth and brandish it as a weapon. And I think this is the counter-counter argument because 
the, the, the others are saying, that's a dangerous thing. It will harm you. It will hurt you. It will threaten your survival, right? Well, don't brandish it as a weapon. One is not seeking truth as a weapon against others. One is seeking truth as a stepping stone forward. It's, it has to be a positive building block because you can no longer build on, on mythology. I mean, we've been doing that for so long and obviously it's not taking us anywhere pleasant, right? And I think this is, this is for us is a serious issue as you know, Ron Hanny and others who are concerned about truth or are concerned about citizenry is to really hammer home that truth is not a weapon. Truth is not dangerous. Tru I'm not taking this truth to you know, bash you over the head with it. I'm just saying, here's the truth. What would you like us to do about it moving forward? There's no moving forward beyond that. And you know, when people talk about there was no reconciliation, there was no proper reconciliation you know, post-war, absolutely. Because no one's talked about what's happened during the war. No one talked, about, and it's not about, you know, except of course when it suits them, they, they, you know, they bring up whatever they, they like, selective memories. It, it's not about you know, using it to, to attack anyone. It's just to say, look, that's what happened. Yeah. And if you realize that's what happened, perhaps you won't do it again. Perhaps you won't slip again. You know, it's all these, you know, cliches of learning from history or, or not learning from history or whatnot. The point is, if one understands the facts and if one has the facts, then it's a totally different possibility, not a, re not, not, not a necessity, but it's a possibility of moving forward, at least in a different uh, trajectory than we've been moving forward. Right. You know, in my, in my, from, from my side, and it's like, I'm saying this as an amateur, I, I sense that the truth is easier to sort of appreciate and, and maybe benefit from when, when violence is behind you. Yes. And vi violence, in a way, is the most difficult obstacle to retaining the truth and sort of benefiting and, and using it to your advantage. So that, that to me is, um, you know, people always talk about coll collective memory in Lebanon. I, I still don't even know really what that means. I mean, there's communal memory in yeah. Lebanon, right? And then there's, uh, there's militia memory. Uh, there may be some very few national stories that we sort of treasure. You know what? Maybe even the national pact is not even that much of a truthful story to begin with. But, but... There is something about, I mean, there, there, there is a, there seems to be, there was at least a genuine yearning to try and see if this could, this experiment could work. And it didn't really work that long. And it crashed the moment violence became part of that story. You can go back to 1958. You can go back to the 19, late 1960s. You can go back to 75, right? You can go back to... Every recent history. Recent <laughs> history. That violence, in a way, kills truth. And then you have to start over. Of course. And that's why I think I always emphasize the need to end war. And we're talking about civil war... When we're talking about civil war, we're talking about militia, really, that take matters into their own hands. And I think that's why I always try to emphasize that should not look at one group's weapons as a sectarian story. And that group, if it was a different confession, shouldn't matter. And there have been other versions that are part of our history now. There's one today that is unfortunately in war mode and I think uh, prevents people searching for truth. And I sense this from Lukman Slim's family, that that's, they're desperate for answers. And they're also, in a way, fully aware that there will never be any investigation. So it's that duality. I lived through it. Other people have lived through it too. Unfortunately, it's not a, it's a, it's not a rare occasion in Lebanon when you have to experience that's, that. But I think that's, that's... in itself is so telling. Exactly. And then, and then you have... I mean, these are not, you, you're challenging friends to come out of their thought process and come to conclusions that are ready, they're available, but no, it's too sensitive. It will, it will cause further flames. It will bring Lebanon to its death. That's, that's and I don't think that Lebanon is heading to its death for these reasons. Not, it's not, these will not. Very good. Yeah, speaking not because up. because of. Right, and I think. Exactly. Not because of, and that's 
maybe where I kind of sort of saw eye to eye with you on Twitter, that there's this speak truth. Don't, don't let, don't let, don't let the fiction steer the story. Even, even when it's a sensitive issue, all, all the more important, if it's sensitive, the truth should outweigh the fiction because of its sensitivity. But for the most part, um, I think even though you see your friends online sharing and you see sort of, you see uh, likes, whatever, you see following, you see sort of, you get messages in your inbox. I honestly don't know if it necessarily translates yet Right. to the street and whether or not uh, this actually means something when it comes to change. I, I don't know. It, 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 for me, it may actually just live online. It's loud. Sometimes it's aggressive. Sometimes it's rewarding, but I'm not sure. It seems to stay there. It seems to stay. Yeah. And that's, I think, yeah. uh, for better or worse, that's, I think, we're, what we're living through right now. That, and that goes back to your earlier questions about, you know, when did you, you know, when did we start to feel the negativity seeping in and i think yeah. it was connected to that it was connected to this notion that you know it's not moving i mean you know it, it's kind of throwing something out there and just kind of it just you know hovers in the air for a bit and then right, right. because it's not translating and you know the, the the euphoria that you described earlier about the october november mood was the that the the fear seems to have been momentarily you know removed but then it's not yeah. back. Yeah. It's not back pretty much recently. And so th this going, going back constantly to this kind of fear mongering, going co back, constantly back to, you know, what, was, what good is it going to do if we put this out there? What good is it going to do if one attains truth or doesn't attain truth? Um, and my, my personal response is, what, 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 what good are we doing uh, ourselves right now? I mean, you know, it's, what's, the alter what's the worst case scenario? Right? And they say, oh, no, the worst case scenario is right? We'll have, like, like yes. you know, warmongering is so easy. I mean, every time this, in, in, I love, I'm not good at these things. I'd love if somebody is willing to do this, you know, kind of graph <laughs> discussion of truth and discussion of war. Yes. I'm willing to bet they spike around the same time. Mm -hmm. Right? Whenever there's discussion of, you know, we need truth. We yep. need to find out. We need to hope you know just unravel things and reveal them and my sense and i hopefully i'm totally off i don't think i'm totally off around that time discussion of war starts to come up right because that's as you yes. said that's that's the that's the response right you and want truth detours. you'll get war detours, of course. To and, and the detours. Yeah. yeah absolutely yeah. of course the, the detours are are you know modus operandi they're constantly yeah. there yeah. <laughs> whatever the yeah. narrative that's the counter narrative but right. when when it it's almost like, you know, pushing for truth and truth on a matter of principle, really on a matter. I don't care personally. I don't care who, as you said, who has the weapons, who doesn't, who was, you know, the target, who was the, it doesn't matter. The, what matters is what's the truth, yeah. right? And let's deal with that. Let's deal with the truth constructively, of course, right? And so but for some reason, truth becomes a threat and truth becomes something to stifle. Unless, of course, unless, of course, it serves the greater agenda, then right. we want nothing but the truth. Right. right? And so it's very selective. It's, you know, the, the machinations are phenomenal. And, you know, we've, I've had these conversations, so many friends, you know, since the, the October revolution, they say, look, always keep in mind, you, you're up against, you know, people who are veterans of machination, of, you know, manipulation of false narratives of rewriting history and rewriting it and rewriting it and media and i mean you know so it's it's a very uphill struggle as you said to the point where it feels like you're not moving anymore it feels like it just goes online stays there right but you yeah. know it's it's the my you know uh, again a lot of people we talk to may not be uh, familiar with these images i remember we were in England at the time when they started chipping away at the Berlin Wall with a small chisel, right? I remember that night, my dad, you know, burst and he's like, turn on the, you know, the TV, it's something amazing happening. And I remember yes. that, that image I'll never forget. There was literally, I think it was like probably an excavation chisel or something mm -hmm. we got from mm -hmm. a lab or something. And he's like, yes, right? yes, yes. That image to my mind is, is very powerful that, you know, 
that's the Berlin Wall, that's a chisel, keep chipping away, right? And so, <laughs> you know, who knows, you know, it's... It, but you know what? You pile... but, but I, so we're, I mean, we're not, you're a bit older than me, but I remember also, I was eight maybe, watching that same image wow. of, of that, that, that little sort of ching ching ching. Yes. Yeah, but yeah. but what you're saying is real because it's not just one person chipping away. Absolutely. The whole city Absolutely. went to Berlin. Yeah. And that's when yeah. truth wins. That's when it Absolutely. takes hold. Yeah. He, there was that one there was that first. I mean, I'm, we probably didn't catch him on TV. Right. right? Yeah. And that's the you know, for me it's I think the difficulty of of, you know, being cooped up because of lockdown again is you're not and you mentioned it earlier about the difference between you know live interviews versus you know cold media as, as McLuhan would say you know we're, we're stuck behind cold media here or my teaching on class and you know the interaction with students or these same conversations running and these same thoughts the, the feedback is is not you know energizing mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. you put something online it stays maybe like is it you know maybe somebody comments retweets doesn't but that's still cold interactive that's just you're not seeing anyone's reaction. You're not marching down, you know, uh, Azari together and saying, oh, my God, I can't believe right. this mood. Yeah. So there's a lot to do with COVID uh, and lockdown for me, definitely. I mean, you know, that, that really has been really tiring. But I think still, you know, come, you know, as I said earlier, just, you know, we're still here, right? And it, it, needs, to, it needs to remain there it, until such a time when we're able to go back in person perhaps or not i don't know uh and and you know perhaps turn it into something productive into something active um uh, but it's tiring <laughs> it's tiring saying we're still here is i think the main reason why i went to see lukman slim's family and i went to their funeral is just to send that message in a personal way that we are all still here, here. and i think um I think truth is the only way out of this disaster. And hopefully we'll live to see some of that sort of take shape. I don't know if we will. What I do know is that we're dating ourselves by referring to the Berlin Wall. You said Mekran was talking about the first Gulf War. I don't think any woman, you know, those are images you have to really have watched on TV. And Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what you, I mean, I remember it, but... I don't think the Instagram generation has any recollection no. <laughs> or they would not know they're too young. Yeah. So that's uh, dating ourselves a bit, but, but I think I mean, they, they have nice references. They have Sahid and they have Bazizi and they 100%. have, you know, they, they yeah. have, they have nice references. You're well. right. And then they captured it in ways that were, would have been impossible before. Absolutely. And you know what? Absolutely. I, I think it's also beneficial to have some of this longer view and to remember the darker years. And sometimes yeah hesitate but not always and calibrate you you maybe you have a feel for when things are heading towards civil strife and you also know when this is just venting your rage and it will not lead to chaos escalate and escalate and maybe that's how you also defeat that sort of narrative too not everything is war 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 exactly exactly i shall say that the three my 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 fondest courses in university where it was a, uh, a philosophy 201 course, not at AUB. This was a 101, 201 combined for yeah. the really enthusiastic, you know, you get six credits, but you have to really sort of read and cool. write. And uh, this is going back now, maybe 20 years ago, maybe more actually. So I, I had my first encounter philosoph philosophy course long ago, and I, I loved it. Second was getting to know Bashar Haider. <laughs> And, and Bashar Haidar, he's, he remains a friend. Uh, he was also a thesis sort of, uh, he was on my committee and- Oh, a reader. Um, so, so, so I forget the name, there was a capstone project that oh, took okay. place of the, yeah, and he kind of, he, nice. he was part of it. So, and, and he's been on the podcast. So I, I met him, I saw him during the protests in downtown Beirut, sort of sat, went and sat next to him at the curb. I think it was in Martyr Square itself. And we had a conversation about where things were moving. And I think I, I look back and like that was the more, one of the more rewarding conversations I had on the streets of Beirut with Bashar Haidar, for philosopher, and uh, stumbling into Dan Dennett on the streets of Beirut when he was oh, a wow. lecturer. Yes. 
and going to his seminar at AUB uninvited, just sort of walking into the class and sitting Very there, nice. sort of trying to take, you know, I didn't pay for it, which is my mistake, <laughs> but that's okay. I was a student back then, just wandered in and getting Very to nice. know him on the streets of Beirut. He came on the tour that I used to give as well. And I kind of just, I learned a lot and sort of the, you have to just listen and maybe uh, absorb because these are heavy conversations and Dan Dennett yeah. is sort of maybe a, a heavier sort of, uh, heavy, yeah. He's a heavyweight. He's a heavyweight. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's sort of, I think attention span is not so wide anymore to have someone like that sharing his ideas. And, but I learned a lot. So that's just my way of saying thank you for tonight. This is one of those conversations I'll remember forever. And uh, you're very kind to spend Friday evening with me. It's a pleasure. Uh, I wouldn't have spent it any other way, to be very honest. This is really you had else to do. So. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> not what I meant, but well read. <laughs> no, 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 certainly not. Really, this is a, a, a very sincere pleasure. And, um, you know, I think, again, to, you know, just to go back to where more or less we started off with, you know, Twitter and, you know, the virtual spheres, it opens up to, you know, such connections and uh, meeting, you know, Ronnie and conversations that actually kind of revitalize the hope of it, revitalize that, you know, as you said earlier, we're still here, we're not alone. And, you know, this is very different than, you know, and hopefully one day soon we'll meet in person and revitalize yeah. even more. But really, and I think there's, a, you know, th this is very significant for me for, on a personal level. It's, thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you for, you know, we went down some fun memories and also, you know, investigated some of the wounds all at the same time. And it's just, it, it's very good to bring this up uh, in a conversational kind of, you know, uh, uh, communication. So I really, really thank you for this. Very memorable, definitely. And I really hope that we will continue this in person sometime soon after the lockdown. I hope, I hope so too. And I, I, I like you, I enjoy the long form. I like just listening and exchanging without interruption. And I think I, I get the feeling from you that this is sort of, it's equally rewarding on your side to just let the ideas simmer a bit without interruption Absolutely. and think through. And um, yeah, I, I share that sentiment completely. And I look forward to our next episode down the road. So thank you, Hanny. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Thank you. Thanks for listening and watching. And a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>